may be seated. Well, we're excited for our worship leader, Zach uh, Horsfield. He gets married in 13 days, church. we got to pray for Zach. Thank you, Zach, for all you do. And we have so many exciting, fun things coming up. Uh, there's a sign-up table out in the lobby for the drive through Nativity. If you want to sign up for that today, please do so. I think we need about 18 actors to pull off the event, and we need some understudies and backups in case someone gets sick or, you know, um, uh, has to go away during that time of the year. But whatever the needs are, we'd love for you to be of assistance. Uh, but I'm thankful that we have these outreaches as an opportunity to speak up for Jesus to our neighborhoods and to our community. I'm thankful for the Fall Festival event that we had where we are, uh, as of Friday, following up now on 120 families that came through our fall festival. And so I'm thankful for these things. Now, many of you know, it's no secret to you, that I'm a fan of the Jacksonville Jaguars. God bless you for putting up with a pastor that has a team that's usually been pretty lousy. This year, my, my golly, they, they're winning. They're winning games. I don't know what's wrong. They're winning games. It's a feeling we're just not used to over in Jaguar country. And uh, I've been studying the team and watching the team each week and enjoying seeing the wins. Uh, there's this one wide receiver that we have that's, that's kind of growing into the role of wide receiver on the team that's really good. His name is Calvin Ridley, and I was able to study his history and his past. Calvin had been cut from the Atlanta Falcons, and he lost an entire season. He was suspended from the NFL for an entire year for the crime of gambling and gambling, uh, really sports gambling, which is highly illegal uh, for those who are involved in sports themselves. And many of you may have grown up, like I did in the 80s, some of you grew up in the 80s, uh, where I was a big baseball fan in the 80s. I, I had as my favorite team the Cincinnati Reds. For whatever reason, I loved the big red machine and all that happened with the Reds. And I was a big Pete Rose fan. And so many of you know about Pete Rose and his history with gambling, where Pete Rose is not, he's one of the greatest history, uh, greatest hitters in the history of baseball, but he is not in the Hall of Fame today because of gambling. And he gambled. As far as we know, though, Calvin Ridley never gambled against his own team. And Pete Rose, as far as we know, he, he denies that he ever gambled against the Cincinnati Reds while he was playing for the Reds. There is one player that has been caught in the last few years that's been accused of betting against his own team. And it's illegal, of course, to do this because you can throw the game. If you're out there, you can throw the game and win the bet and make money even though your team loses. And it was this uh, college game. It was Iowa State defense lineman. Defensive lineman Isaiah Lee, in a 2021 game just a few years ago against Texas, he bet that his own team would lose that game. And he went out and played the game. He didn't play as good as he usually plays. He was released from that team, and shocker, he is not playing anywhere today in football. And so it's hard for us to imagine betrayal for a player. As we are opening our Bibles today, and I hope you have your copy of the Word of God, I want you to open them up to Mark chapter 14. We're going to be looking today and finishing today the betrayal chapter of Mark. You have these chapters in the Gospels where the disciples flee or depart from Jesus. And this is the chapter where Jesus warned them all that you will all betray me. You will all deny me before this day is over. You will all deny me. And we see as we've been working through this chapter, uh, the betrayal by Judas. And then also all of the disciples are fleeing, after, uh, fleeing away from Jesus being arrested, and then we get to the final passage of Mark 14, where we are today, and we have Peter's denial of Jesus Christ. I don't know what would ever go into the mind of a player other than money, the ambition of money, to bet against your own team. And I don't know really what would go into the mind of a disciple to, to deny uh, his Lord, but this is something we all need to wrestle through, and we all need to, in humility, understand we could very easily fall into what Peter has done in this passage. And so there are none of us that are above this. And if any man thinks that he stands, let him take heed, lest he fall, is the warning from the New Testament. So if you have your copy of the, the Bible open, let's read. I'm going to read uh, starting in verse 66 and then going down to verse 72. Let me read for us the Word of God. Let's stand for the reading of the Word of God. And as Peter was below in the courtyard... One of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene Jesus. 
But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly, you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Let me pray for us. Father, we're thankful for your word. And we ask you would help us each in humility to receive what we're reading and to understand any of us are prone to denying you. But Father, that you would bless us to be obedient and to stay faithful. And Father, thank you that your word promises you will persevere us. And I just pray that as we study this, Lord, uh, that you would bless us to, to grow and to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And Father, we are thankful today for this amazing, great salvation you have worked for us in your son, Jesus that you planned before you laid the foundations of the earth, that Christ, the sinless, died in the place of the sinner, in our place, condemned, he stood. Thank you, Father, for this amazing salvation. Bless us not to grow weary and not to uh, turn away once our hands have been placed to that plow, but may we, by your grace, press forward and be bold by your grace in this world for Jesus. I pray this over us now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I think everyone in the room knows the context of this passage. This is right before the cross. This is right before Jesus is to go to the cross. He's been arrested. He left the Garden of Gethsemane where he prayed, where his disciples wouldn't pray, and Peter wouldn't pray. And he said three times, please pray. Please stand watch and pray for temptation is coming. They wouldn't. And so as he gets arrested after the Garden of Gethsemane, through the betrayal of Judas Iscariot, Peter is following along and he goes into the courtyard, uh, I believe first of Caiaphas and now of Annas, the high priest. And as he's in the courtyard, Jesus is going through the trials. Peter is warming himself in the courtyard here of this temple area. And, And as we see him in the courtyard in verse 66, the servant girl, one of the servant girls of the high priest shows up and and seeing him warming himself, she looks at him and says, you also were with the Nazarene, Jesus. All of the disciples have fled at this point. John is the only one we know that that hung around within distance and then was there at some point at the cross. But now they are all fleeing and Peter is trying to follow at a distance. But as we meditate on Peter's denial of Jesus today, let me give you three applications from this passage that I believe apply to all of our lives today. The first one is you want to sense the visibility of one's faith. Sense the visibility of, of one's faith. And so looking at the gospel accounts, we see quite a multitude of people who recognize Peter as a disciple of Jesus Christ. You have quite a recognition of him in this very passage. First one is the servant girl of the high priest mentioned here and also in John 18, 17. The only additional information that John 18, 17 gives us is that she was the doorkeeper of this courtyard. And she sees Peter and recognizes, okay, this is someone that was with this Nazarene Jesus who's under trial. Mark also gives us in verse 69 of this passage, a, a, the, it says, And the servant girl saw him again, again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. So uh, Matthew records another girl uh, speaking to Peter, where, where Mark has the same servant girl here. And then in, in Luke, Luke mentions a man who accompanied the second girl in Luke 22:58, And then Mark mentions the bystanders here in verse 70. Uh, But John tells us that there is this uh, speaker in that group of bystanders who is a relative of of Malchus, who is the man whose ear Peter had cut off earlier that night, just a few moments before. And so there were a lot of folks in this courtyard that understood and recognized this is one of the ones following Jesus. This is Peter. This is the one that, that cut off the ear of Malchus. And he begins to deny it, of course, again and again and again. And we see Peter's denial. But it's just amazing how many people in this courtyard in the middle of the night recognize Peter as a disciple and a follower of Jesus Christ. You know, I've been able 
over the years to drop by the workplaces of some of the folks that work in or attend our churches. And over the years, it's one of my favorite things to do, to go to see where you work and to meet some of your coworkers. In this church, I've never had a bad experience where I go and meet one of you and meet you in the workplace, and I always love just meeting your coworkers. And I've had many of your own coworkers tell me how much they love you and how much they're so glad they work with you. And it's a lot of fun to meet your coworkers. I've had some of your coworkers mention to me they know that you come to this church and that you're a Christian, and they love that you're involved in the church, and I think that's wonderful. I've never had a bad experience in this church at all. People speak highly of you as I've been out to visit you and your, your place of work. But there was a man years ago where I went to go meet him in his workplace. He asked me to come by and meet him in his workplace. It was not at this church, a different church. I go by to meet him. He was not there. He was late. And I was there to talk to his co-workers briefly, waiting on him to show up. And finally, he delayed so much that I just had to go. But I said, listen, just let him know his pastor dropped by to see him. And I had co-worker after co-worker say, you mean to tell me he goes to church? And I'm like, uh-oh, this is not going good. And I'm like, um, yeah, he comes to our church. Oh, pastor, you got to work on him. Man, he's one of the worst workers we have. He's always late. He, he's, he's got a foul mouth and a short temper. And I'm like, oh, man, this is way too much. This is way more than I wanted to hear. This is not good. But I was shocked how many people at least, you know, uh, the, the, as they go into your workplaces, know about your faith as I talk to folks in your workplace. Can I just tell you this, that people recognize if you're a true follower of Jesus or not. They recognize it. And you may think, well, my faith is a private thing. We in America strive to be secularists, I guess, where we go into the workplace and nobody wants faith to be a discussion. We're, we're kind of told, let's not talk about those things, but the reality is faith has a way of coming out. And Faith has a way of being seen and noticed. Your life is known whether you know it or not. And can I tell you today, faith is never something that is private. It always spills into your life. It always spills into everything you're doing. And we've talked about this over and over this year, that the most important factor in your life that determines your behavior and how you treat others and your joy and how you deal with hardships is God and your faith and your view of God and your doctrine. And so theology and doctrine matters because it spills into everything you do, every area of your life. I, I don't believe you can ever separate your faith from anything you're doing, and you shouldn't. You should always allow Christ to reign as Lord over your entire life, and I love seeing how that does spill out for many of you. Uh, one of my favorite stories, uh, Ray Bearden comes from you. Ray's here today. Uh, Ray had someone that he was working with come up to him and just say, are you a pastor? And he said, well, you know, how would you how would you know to ask me that? Like, like, why would you ask me that? Uh, what does a pastor look like to you? It was Ray's question. And they said, well, a pastor looks like you, you know? And, uh, and he said, yes, I happen to be a pastor. And so it's, it's just this visibility about what we do with Jesus. I've had people catch me over the years and just say, you have to be a Christian because I've never heard you curse. Are you a Christian or something? I'm like, yep, you got me. I'm a Christian. You caught me. All right. So what now? Uh, and it's a lot of fun. It's fun to see that happen. Peter had been recognized by all of these folks in the courtyard as a follower and, and one of the disciples, the closest disciple to Jesus, one of the closest disciples to Jesus. And you have to sense that your faith is something that is visible and seen, and it is something that should be seen more and more. We are in a day and age where people need to see people of faith. And we have to be as Christians bold because I'll tell you what, we have the cure and the culture does not. We have the source of life in Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through Him. And we can't hoard that. We can't be the ones that just hang on to Christ and don't share Christ. It's not that we're anything great. It's that He's everything great. And we're just beggars showing other beggars where the good bread is. That's all it is. We're just showing them where the bread can be found. It's not about us. It's all about Jesus. But this city needs bold believers that aren't ashamed to let their faith spill into their livelihood and lives. For Peter, that had happened until this evening when he's losing his religion and denying his faith. So Peter begins to deny. He begins to do all sorts of things. Second point that I want to go into today as we meditate on Peter's denial of Jesus. Number one, you want to sense the visibility of one's faith. Number two, you want to study the seriousness of Peter's sin. And there are a lot of people that study this passage and get it wrong. They think, they see some things and interpret it in a way that's wrong. So I'll try my best to interpret what he's doing here. But I want you to see in the notes, Peter's sins in this passage begin to grow exponentially. First, he lies. 
and he denies knowing Jesus. I don't know him. That, that's a flat out lie. I don't know Jesus. You, you're with Jesus. You're one of those Nazarenes that's with Jesus. You're with the Nazarite, the, the Nazarene Jesus. You're from Galilee. You're with him. And nope, I'm not. I don't know. He says in verse 68, I neither know nor understand what you mean. It's like Peter looked and said, no habla ingles. You know, he just, like, I don't understand the words coming out of your mouth. I have no idea what you're saying. What are you saying to me? Please help me out. And he's playing dumb. And the girl is not falling for it. And so she again begins to say in verse 68 to all the bystanders, hey, uh, everybody, this man's one of them. This, this guy's one of them. He, he's, one, he's right here. Here he is. And then he, he, he says again, I don't know him. Certainly you're one of them, for you're a Galilean. But again, verse 70, he denies it. He denied it again. And so second, he, he lies again. He's double lied now. He lied again when he, he said he didn't know Jesus again. And then he lied when eventually we get to him swearing and cursing. And so let's go into what all that means. Um, certainly you're one of them. You're, you're a Galilean. We, we can tell by your accent. You're not one of us simple people. You're, you're one of the, those people that were with Jesus. Verse 71, he began to invoke a curse on himself. I know certain passages or certain translations will say he began to curse and swear. Many will read that and think, well, man, he became a sailor. He started just letting it loose. Expletives were flowing out of Peter's mouth. That's not at all the, the correct interpretation of what was happening with what Peter was saying. When it says he began to curse, it means he began to say things like, may God curse me down to hell if I'm lying to all of you. He was invoking on himself curses. May this temple fall to the ground if I'm not being truthful with all of you here. May, may, may God strike me now with lightning if, if I'm lying. May God curse me. That's what it means when he's cursing. He's cursing. And then he begins to take oaths, which the Bible is very serious. And even Jesus has a lot of teachings. Do not swear an oath. Do not swear an oath. But be, let your yes be yes and your no be no. He began to go against the very teachings of Jesus and the Bible and began to swear. And again, swearing does not mean he began to curse and, and say curse words. It just means he began to swear oaths that he did not know Jesus. If I'm lying to you, I swear to you that I'll give all my money to this temple. If, if I'm lying to you, I swear to you right now, I will uphold a Nazarite vow for seven years. I won't drink any alcohol. I won't let any razor come to my hair. If, if I'm lying to you, I swear. I, you know, that's what it means that Peter was swearing. And it's serious to invoke the name of God in your own lie. I mean, it's one thing to lie, but to bring God into it and to lie by the name of God and say, I swear to you by God, I'm not lying to you. And he was lying to them. And he was the one that said to Jesus, Jesus, they're all going to walk away from you, but I will never deny you. Oh, Peter, oh, Peter, before the, the rooster crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. I'll never deny you. I'll never deny you. And then the, the rooster crows at verse 72. Immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus said to him before the rooster crows. Before we get into that, I mean, let's just talk about the seriousness of, of these sins. It, it's, it would have been better had he just said some curse words, right? I mean, I hate to put like sins on a scale here, but when you're bringing God's name into it and lying and invoking the name of God, it's worse than taking God's name in vain. It's involving God in a lie. And God cannot lie. And it's not just a denial of Christ. It's a complete repudiation of what Christ taught and everything Christ has led followers of Christ to believe and behave and to do. And we see that sin has a way of just spreading. And he, there he was. Yeah, peer pressure. Everyone's around him. Had to be frightening. Jesus was bound and heading to death. And Peter's life is on the line. And so he, he covers it up and he, and he lies. The Bible is full of stories where sin just gets out of control quickly. Sin runs rampant. Sin has a way of doing that. Sin is something that went unchecked as a way of becoming a destructive fire. Growing out of control. I think about David and he should have been off at war and there he was on the roof walking around and he saw Bathsheba bathing and he told his servants go and get that girl for me and Dave slept with Bathsheba Bathsheba became pregnant Bathsheba was married to one of David's not just regular army men not just a man of the kingdom but one of his 
one of his faithful men, one of David's mighty men. Uriah the Hittite was one of David's most faithful warriors. He was like the apex of warriors. And David had betrayed this man, Uriah, had slept with his wife, impregnated his wife. He brings Uriah home. He has Uriah go, try to go home and, and gets Uriah drunk. Uriah won't do it. And he says to his commander, listen, I want you to put this man into the battle. And I want you to put him out at the front of the battle. And I want you to retreat behind him, but leave him out there. Let him die. And so Josiah, his general, does that and, and puts Uriah the Hittite out there. And Uriah the Hittite dies. Bathsheba mourns for her husband. And we read this in the Old Testament. And we think, man, Dave gets away with it. You read for a bit and nothing happens. But then there's that moment, right? That moment of conviction. God chastens those whom he loves. God will discipline his children. God will convict you if you are sinning. The Bible tells us in 1 John, no one who... Uh, knows the Lord can go on continuing in sin. Doesn't mean that we don't struggle with sin anymore. It just means we cannot go on sinning without getting conviction about it and, and some type of like brokenness about it. You have this moment where Nathan the prophet goes into King David and tells David this amazing story. David had been raised a shepherd. He says, "Hey David, there's someone in your kingdom, and uh, he, he's this man who owns like a thousand sheep. Man, he's got thousands of sheep, thousands of animals, and." And his neighbor, who's very, very poor, all he has is one little lamb. And his poor neighbor raised this little lamb like his own son. I mean, you know, just threw birthday parties for it every year and hugged it and and loved it, this little lamb like his own son. And this party was happening for the, the rich man. And you know what he did? Rather than kill one of his own little lambs, he had all those lambs. He went to the neighbor, the poor neighbor, and took one of his lamb, his only lamb, and killed it and fed it to his guests. David was enraged when Nathan told him the story. He said, bring that man to me. I'll kill that man. Bring him to me. He will die. And Nathan looked at him with his finger and pointed at him and said, David, you are that man. You are that man. Because that's exactly what David had done with Uriah the Hittite. David was convicted of his sin. He was broken over it. He goes away and he writes in his brokenness and contrition. He writes Psalm 51, one of the greatest passages in all the Bible for contrition. Contrition is that moment of brokenness that every true follower of Jesus feels when we are caught in our sins. So let me, let me be clear here. If you are sinning and you are not feeling any conviction, any contrition about it at all, and you're able to go on sinning all you want to sin and you're having the time of your life, let me say to you and cry foul to your life, that is a red flag on conversion. That is a red flag on conversion. Baptists get into a lot of trouble because we teach once you're saved, you're always saved. And we have all sorts of people that say, oh, you Baptists, all you do is give people a get out of hell free card. And you tell people once they're saved, they're always saved. And all that's doing is telling them they can go and sin all they want to sin. Can I tell you, if you're really a Christian, you cannot live that way. You cannot go out here and sin all you want to sin. The Holy Spirit will convict you, will break you. He will have a moment of contrition where you will be internally broken and remorseful over your sin. And I think for every true child of God, you know exactly the feeling I'm talking about, that moment where the guilt floods in, the moment of brokenness. God, I've sinned against you. Have mercy on me, God, a sinner. I've, I've broken your commands. I've gone against your holiness. Please forgive me. Cleanse me. Every Christian should have those moments of, of contrition and brokenness. That moment where the conviction floods in happened to Peter right here in verse 72. As we meditate on Peter's denial of Jesus, we sense the visibility of one's faith. We study the seriousness of Peter's sin. All sin is serious. Number three, we survey the signs of spiritual breakdown. Immediately the rooster crowed. Look at verse 72. Immediately the rooster crowed, just like Jesus said it would happen earlier in the chapter. It crowed a second time, exactly the amount of times that Jesus said would happen. And Peter remembered how Jesus said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. He broke down and he wept. Survey the signs of spiritual breakdown. We have many in our culture that are going through physical breakdowns. Many in our culture. Maybe many of you in this room have gone through what I'm about to describe. Physical breakdowns, before they occur in someone's life, physical breakdowns, they have symptoms that you want to watch for. The three that we're warned about that that all of you need to be aware of and be watchful of If you're going to have a a physical, mental breakdown, what happens is you'll have anxiety attacks. You have these moments where anxiety will rush and flood in, 
and for minutes to up to an hour, you are just flooded with absolute anxiety. You are frozen in fear. You can't think straight. You, you're in a, a, a tizzy. You, you're just dizzy with anxiety. And then they go away, and, and your, your sanity comes back. You're able to think clearly pretty well. A lot of folks in our culture today are going through anxiety attacks with all the stress that Americans are going through and a lot of the busyness that we're going through. And so another symptom that's more serious is a panic attack. A panic attack is the next level of warning. It's your body's warning system saying, you've got you to gotta take care of yourself here. You've got to do something. Panic attacks can happen for an hour to multiple hours. Where your, your adrenaline is racing, your heart's racing, and you, you just cannot think beyond the stress of what you're going through. And it is immensely hitting you. If you do not take drastic steps during anxiety attacks and panic attacks to adjust your life and to begin to address your soul and to slow down and deal with the stress and deal with time, you're heading to a full-blown nervous breakdown. And that's the final step. Nervous breakdowns last days to weeks. That's when your body shuts down. There are different types of breakdowns, but a full-blown body nervous breakdown, some of you in this room have had them. They're no fun to go through. These are the symptoms you want to be aware of before you get to the nervous breakdown. And you want to take whatever steps necessary to address it. When you study Peter and his denial of Jesus, for many believers, they read this and they go, well, how on earth, how on earth is there any way possible I could get to a trying situation just like Peter, and, and I don't want to deny Jesus. I don't want to deny Jesus. How could I guard against such a thing? Like, why would Peter fall, and what can help me not to, if there's any way possible? Or, or am I just going to fall like Peter falls? And Mark chapter 14 chronicles so many things, a path of spiritual breakdown that is just a true warning sign to all of us in this room as it was to Peter. And you see these warning signs throughout the chapter in Peter's path. First thing we see is Peter was very prideful. Look at verse 29. I've already quoted it, but verse 29 of chapter 14. Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. Everyone else is going to fail you, but I'm not. I'm I'm better than them, Jesus. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to fall away. And even though, Jesus, you're telling me I will, I'm not believing you. I'm not going to do it. Peter could not humble himself to hear what Jesus was warning him of. And he was pridefully overstepping everything Jesus was saying. He even says in verse 31, If I must die with you, Jesus, I will not deny you. If I must die with you, I will not deny you. All of the disciples following Peter's leadership said the same thing out loud. And then Jesus made it very clear before this night's over, you're all going to deny me. All of you will deny me. Verse 30 says that, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. He's saying that to uh, to Peter directly. And so they're having this back and forth, but Peter was very prideful. He believed in his own strength and efforts. He could overcome everything that he was being warned about. He was going to stand on his own two feet and be able to make it through this night, not denying Jesus Christ. Verse 47, if you look down in the chapter, Peter was very presumptuous. He was jumping ahead of everything. Verse 47, but one one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest. And cut off his ear. We know who that is based on the other Gospels. That's Peter that did this. And Jesus had to heal the man's ear. He had to warn Peter. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And he says quite a bit in the other Gospels. To to Peter and to the disciples. About what Peter was trying to do. But Peter was taking the situations into his own account. He was becoming impulsive. And just jumping ahead. And doing things that weren't really within God's plan. For that night at all. He wasn't obeying and listening and yielding to the plan of God. He was trying to forge his own path. And boy, that's something we all can do. Where we all really just, in our own way, ignore God and just try to forge our own path. We all all treat God oftentimes as a spare tire. We only reach for God when the car breaks down. And then, then we need God. Other than that, we don't care to really seek Him out. The, the most harmful thing in Peter's path was Peter was prayerless. And we see that in Mark 14, 33 through 38. Peter was asked directly by Jesus three separate times in this passage, please stay alert. Please pray. The hour of temptation is coming. He was warning Peter of his own temptation that was coming as well to be tempted to deny Jesus. Stay awake and pray. If you will just pray. 
all three times in those verses, Peter couldn't do it. He could not stay awake. He had to he, he had to sleep. He fell asleep. And so we see this character of Peter throughout this chapter. He was impatient. You know, as, as you and I go through prayerlessness ourselves, often Christians will go through seasons where they're just not praying. Or maybe they're praying, their heart's not in it. Have you ever done that where you just you find yourself you're praying and you're kind of going through the motions of prayer? You're kind of saying the same things to God, but your heart's just, man, your, your mind's elsewhere. That's, that's common. It's a battle. We have to really work as we pray to pray and to be engaged. I want to give you some symptoms that, that you want to write down of your life that will be true of you if you don't pray. If you don't pray and get involved in prayer, you will grow into impatience. A busy and prayerless heart relies on its own strength and power to get things done and make things work. And once you get drained and busy, you grow weary and frustrated and you start to go around and grow impatient with others. You'll snap at everyone in your path, your kids, your spouse, your co-workers, the weather, church mates. Another symptom of prayerlessness is you will grow anxious, anxiety. The result of being self-reliant while lacking self-sufficiency, we become experts at worrying. The biblical term for stress is the word anxiety. And being gripped by fear because of the uncertainty of situations results in, in much and much anxiety. It leads also, when you don't pray, uh, it leads you towards pride, like we see what Peter did here. You become prayerless, and you begin to fall back on uh, your own uh, you know, uh, experiences and your own uh, self-reliance. And, and you, you do not trust in the Lord much as you pray. You you're going forward through the mess of what's coming on your own strength. And then I think the final symptom of a prayerless life is uh, joylessness. Joylessness. There's a childlike joy that comes from fearing God and submitting to Him and His will. And there's something about getting into God's presence, laying your burdens before Him, trusting Him to act, and leaving those things at His feet that gives joy. David said in Psalm 63, O oh God, You are my God. Earnestly I seek You. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land. And then I would give a final one, uh, even one beyond joylessness. If you're not praying, it's going to lead you to regretful outcomes, which is exactly where this led Peter in this night. When we do not take the time to properly pray, we follow our own stomachs, our own wallets, our own fleshly desires, and we end up making regrettable decisions. And so we can see those things pushed aside as we focus on our time with the Lord and we begin to pray. And so looking at this, he broke down. The symptoms were there throughout the chapter. And Peter broke down. I have to ask you this morning, how are you doing? Are there symptoms in your life that are leading you towards a breakdown? Maybe a physical breakdown, but maybe a spiritual one. Maybe one where you are just living in full-blown anxiety. There is no joy. You've been laboring too far in your own strength. You've not got into the Lord's presence to seek His voice. You're following your own wills and, and not His. And, and you've put God in the trunk of your life, and He's only going to come out when the car breaks down. Is that possibly a descriptor for you? Or are you someone that's every day, every moment, saying, Jesus, I need your help. I need Thee. Oh, I need Thee. Every hour I need Thee. Help me. Are you? Where are you in your prayer life? Where are you? Can I give you a few applications, and I'm going to pray for us. We're going to observe the Lord's Supper after these applications. Here's, here's some applications from this passage. All of the points are application, but in echo to those things, here's the conclusion for you today. Number one, work towards improving a visible faith to others. Work towards this. I encourage you and challenge you to talk about Jesus in the workplace. Talk about Israel and Palestine gently, and then talk about Jesus. Talk about the Bible. Talk about God. Talk about church. Talk about prayer. When you know someone, a coworker or a neighbor is going through a very difficult time, throw it out there and just say, listen, I'm a praying person. I, can I pray for that? Do, you, do I have your permission to pray for you over what you've just shared? And just throw that out as a gentle witness. You'll be amazed what the Lord can do through something as easy as just offering to pray for someone. Uh, let me challenge you, number two, an application from this. Seek a, seek a sensitivity towards your sin. You want to keep a sharp conscience about sin through meditation on Scripture and prayers of repentance. If you're battling and struggling with a certain sin, look up certain verses in the Bible that deal with that specific sin. 
and keep the conscience sharp as you battle sin. When I was in middle school, one of the illustrations I remember, my middle school Sunday school teacher teaching me. So Sunday school teachers, don't forget, like you're making an impact here. Uh, I remember this. He said that we have a spinning blade in our hearts. And what happens is when we sin, that blade will cut into us and we feel conviction. And, And then over time, if we're not dealing with our sin well, that blade will get dull. And we sin the next time and it doesn't feel so bad. And we sin the third time, fourth time. You get down to the 20th time, you're not feeling it at all. You feel pretty good sinning. And so our sin school teacher said, you need to keep that blade sharp. You need to keep your conscience sharp. You need to study the Word of God and pray about what you're going through with sin and sharpen that blade. And so, church, sharpen that blade. Keep the conscience sharp. Final thing is you need to spend some time in prayer with God. Some of you here need to go and pray with Him today. You need to take a walk and just talk to Him openly about everything that's giving you full anxiety. You just need to exhaust yourself in prayer to Him. You need to maybe take time this week, schedule some time. You will not regret doing so if you'll just take time and find a park or somewhere you can get alone with God and and talk with them. There have been times where we've had people in this room that have said, I don't have anywhere to go and pray, but I know I need to go and pray. And what we've done over the years is we'll open up this sanctuary, we'll vacate the building, uh, we'll at least give you a time where no one's in here. You can come into this room by the permission of our church and you can pray in here and talk to God as long as you need to talk to Him. This is a praying room and a wonderful place, and that is offered to you if you need it. you just got to call ahead and, and set that up with us. Most days, if we're here, we can get you in here and let you pray. Let me pray for all of us now, and then as I'm doing this, let's all pray and prepare our hearts to observe the Lord's Supper. Father, we're thankful for your word. We thank you, Father, for everything that happened, not just uh, through the night of the cross, of course, We thank you for the restoration of Peter that we know came. That Father Peter was restored unto leadership, Jesus, by you. That no matter how far we've sinned, Christ, you do forgive and you do restore and you do come and heal. I pray that in our hearts today as we are wrestling, all of us, with our own sin, Christ, you would equip us, strengthen us, give us grace in our battle, and Father, give us victory. May we walk in the freedom of obedience and not be held to the bondage of any sin at all. And may we not give the devil any foothold by your grace. Father, I pray that you would bless us to be bold Christians, to be those that would speak out and live out our faith unashamedly. Christ, you died on that cross unashamedly for us. May we live unashamedly for you. And so I pray that you would help us through that and bless us. Lord, help us to be sensitive towards our own sins. You are a holy and righteous God, and we are to be holy as you are holy. We cannot be holy in our our own strength, but Holy Spirit, you indwell us. And so may you convict us and bless our obedience and battle against sin and help us to stay sharp against sin and may our consciences remain sharp by your grace. And Father, I pray that you would help us to get into your presence, to not lean into our own understanding, but in all of our ways, may we acknowledge you and may our fear of you spill into every decision we make. That every decision we would be concerned about, what would God want me to to do? What would Jesus ask me to do in this decision? May we yield our decisions before your Lordship. May you bless our decision making and guide us when we need to make them. And I pray that as we observe the Lord's Supper now, work in us. and, And may you even help us to confess sins this morning that need to be confessed by your grace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to have the Lord's Supper.